Thank you kindly. Hello, good evening and welcome to Through the Keyhole, the show that takes an estate agent's eye view of the homes of the famous. Tonight, as always, what we've done is to get the keys to two fascinating homes of well-known people. And with Lloyd's help, what we're going to do is to take a privileged peek behind closed doors. But the question is, whose closed doors? Well, to try and answer that question tonight, we've got three connoisseurs of all that's, all that's beautiful in life. Our first panellist tells me that as a child, he was half good and half bad. He used to help old ladies halfway across busy streets. <laughs> Mr. William Rushton. <laughs> Mark Twain wrote that uh, news is anything that causes a woman to say, my goodness. Well, news in this case is what causes our next guest to say, here are the headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, Moira Stewart. <laughs> and finally, we've got an author who took up his career as a writer as soon as he left university. And within six months, he'd already sold several articles. His watch, his overcoat, <laughs> his typewriter. He's Alan Coram. <laughs> now let me tell you a little more about the, about the game. With the help of these magic keys here, we'll be taking a careful look inside two fascinating homes. And that should tell us something about the person who lives there. Maybe quite a bit. All that our friends here have got to do is to try and work out who that is. So let's join Lloyd Grossman now at house number one and watch closely because remember, the clues are there as we go through the keyhole. This isn't just the average suburban house. Look at that wonderful stonework. It's obviously got a touch of the Windsor castles. Now, there may be a slight transatlantic flavor here as well. Look at this American-style mailbox and what grand double doors. Musical, too. They seem to be music lovers, and they obviously like television. This is a gargantuan structure, isn't it? Huge television screen and a huge stereo underneath it. So they're quite modern people in terms of their taste in entertainment. They're also either a large family or they have lots of friends because this sitting room has got 10 very, very generous seats in it. And they're all quite proper as well. So this is quite a well-behaved household. Now, there seems to be a tremendous feeling for the countryside here. There are lots of green plants around, lots of landscape paintings. Maybe, in fact, they're country folk who've moved to town and they still have a longing to return to where they came from. This dining area has quite a splendid chandelier, and like the rest of the drawing room, there's a very dense population of chandeliers. So there seems to be a certain love of glamour and glitter. Now, the dining room table with its eight chairs is very formal, very well organized. But I don't think it gets used very much. I would imagine that this family is more casual, probably part of the sandwich brigade. What is interesting here are these two great, rather throne-like chairs next to the dining table. So there must be two very dominant personalities in this household. And look at the video library. There does appear to be a fascination with classic show business. Well, in spite of the plush Mickey Mouse, this is very much a boy's room. It's frightfully macho. Look at all this tiger imagery, tiger on the wall, tiger on the windowsill. And these people seem to be very keen on physical fitness. There's a set of weights here. Well, I've never seen such flashy tea towels. <laughs> Let's look at the evidence. The musical greeting, the showbiz tapes. What sort of person lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed there, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, so not for our panel, 
Here's whose house it is. <laughs> William Rushton, it calls upon you to begin the psychological examination. It's a they, which I immediately thought they must be a double act. It's then a I, they. It's a, they. You kept saying they. Then it was ten seats. So I thought a troop of acrobats. <laughs> I mean, the chandeliers all within easy swinging distance of each other, I noticed. <laughs> so you can actually watch those enormous televisions, short-sighted acrobats who like to swing from the chandeliers <laughs> while watching. Um, interesting only eight chairs in the dining room if you're seating ten in the other room, but perhaps two of the acrobats don't eat. <laughs> um, predominant colours, very interesting, black and white. Even dear old Lloyd appeared quite colourful, I thought, for a change. Um, so it's a double act of trapeze artists with a fear of smelling, because of all those strange unguents in the bathroom, who used to appear in very, very old movies. Well, that's a pretty good analysis there, Moira. I don't think they're men, I think they're women. I think it's uh, uh, some singing ladies, probably uh, some singing ladies. Singing ladies. Indeed. I don't know quite the, what they're doing with the dumbbells, but other than that, I'm, I've got a definite feeling of uh, femininity. Oh, all right, Ben, you think they sing? Indeed. Right, so we've got singing gentlemen, singing ladies. No, singing acrobats, haven't we? Alan. Mine don't sing. Mine just swing. Right. <laughs> I thought it had the quality of an Indian restaurant. I mean, it had that feel in the uh, chandeliers, all of which were bought at the same time. That house hadn't happened organically. They'd gone along either to a failed Indian restaurant and bought up a job lot and put it all in, <laughs> or it actually was the anteroom to an Indian restaurant. Uh, that strange, fake Yorkstone cardboard cladding on the outside to differentiate it from the rest, and the scalextric cars. I think there are probably a couple of Indian restaurateurs that race for the Bombay scalextric team. <laughs> <laughs> That's when now the panel and not, as you'll have seen here, entirely in agreement. So we are going to have to narrow this down slightly. Um, William, have you got further clues from what Moira and Alan have added? Certainly. I, I now have two Indian lady trapeze artists. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm thumbing through. I, honestly, I can't remember any. It's probably pretty big in her own native land, but unknown to me. Um, I would say it, it's Russ Conway and his wife. <laughs> Well, Mr. as you see, Conway, the, if there is a Mrs. Conway, yes, as you see, there wasn't a burst of innovation. No. There, so it's not, it's not in fact Russ Conway or his wife, Moira. I have no good reason to think so, but I think it's one of the homes of the Beverly, one of the Beverly sisters. One of the Beverly sisters? No, not even three of the Beverly sisters. <laughs> Alan. The audience has been totally unresponsive to any of this. I will still go for the furniture showroom. I think it's where Waring and Gillow is. <laughs> Probably in sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've done very well, I think you'll agree, very creatively there. But in fact, they haven't found out that it is Britain's answer to Jackson 5, five star. <laughs> welcome, welcome to you all, Stedman and Denise. And Doris. Doris, that's Denise, yes. right? And that's Lorraine. Yeah. And that's Delroy. Yes. Right. right. Got you all there. <laughs> now, did you recognise the description of your house? Were any of you ever wanted to be trapeze artists? No. Not no, really, not no. Really. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of heights anyway. You're afraid of heights? So he, he couldn't have been a trapeze artist. I don't know how you could have thought of that. <laughs> Ravitch and Landau wasn't very close either. That was close. close. Oh. That, that wasn't too close. Closer than most. Your father was in the music business, right? That's right. Uh -huh. 12, 25 years. Fun? over 25 years. Right. Accomplice yeah. musician. Didn't you want to be a footballer? That's you? right. <laughs> I wanted to play for England. Good ambition. Well, you wanted to play for England too. Uh, yes. At yeah. Netball. Yeah. And, and uh, do you still keep up with the football? I play now and then, when I have spare time. You know, when we're not working, obviously, I miss about a little bit. But not too often. I see. Do you work at home as well? That's yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We do and all rehearse. the dancing in the, mm, in in the front there. Mm -hmm. Move all the sofas back and dance there. Dance on the table. Do you use the dining <laughs> table at all, or just the dancing? <laughs> um, just for Sunday, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Now, the thing you always read out about a successful group like this is <clears throat> then eventually someone sets out on a solo career. Will, will any mm. of you ever do that? Well, I think at the moment, just within the groups, we'll have our own chances to sing solo, like Delroy has already 
myself and Lorraine. So there's four of us singing at the moment, mm. but, but you know, as individuals five within Five Star. Yeah. Well, I see. And we would like to present you with our Through the Keyhole ah. key, our gold key as Thank a souvenir you. of your visit here and our visit to you. Thank you all, Five Star, Thank for being you. with us. We'll take a break <laughs> and then our house detective will be at it again. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, welcome back to Through the Keyhole. In our post bag this week, Mrs Travis of Doncaster writes, We've been quoted nearly £3,000 to have our small semi-detached painted. What do you advise? Well, Mrs Travis, Lloyd says, Surely wouldn't it be cheaper to have it photographed? <laughs> Good thought, Lloyd. Right? And now let's join Lloyd at house number two. So watch out for the clues right now as we go... Through the keyhole. Living in a tent is probably taking back to the land a bit too far, I think. But actually, these people don't lead such a spot in life here in the country after all. Even though they do lots of digging and hoeing, they've produced this immensely civilized, frightfully lush garden. What's really interesting here, though, is what sort of person lives in a shocking pink house in the country. Is it an eccentric or maybe just a rugged individualist? Let's go inside and have a look. This very modest dining room would seem to belong to people who don't entertain very much. I think these people are very, very self-contained and they think their own company is more than interesting enough. This wall hanging would seem to be the sort of thing that someone who taught pottery to girl guides would have. It's very sort of arts and craftsy and folksy, isn't it? Now, as we go into the hall, we can see more similar bits of arts and crafts. Only in this case, they're ethnic. They come from all over the world. They're probably souvenirs brought back by an enthusiastic traveler. The interesting thing about this hall is that it's so big in such a small house. So I can picture people rushing across here. This is the center of the household, and it would seem to belong to someone who wants to know everything that's going on in the house. Let's have a look at the sitting room now. It's a very functional, unfussy room. You can imagine lots of children bouncing around in here without any concern about damaging the furniture. It's quite a tough room. And I see that the green fingers theme extends in here as well. There's a big weeping fig in the corner, and even the piano has flowers painted on it. There are lots of small pictures all over this room. Even the wallpaper looks like a comic strip. I think these people are restless, they have a short attention span, they need constant stimulation. Certainly television is an important part of their lives. There's a huge television set here, and the furniture seems ideally arranged for watching television. So they're serious TV viewers. Looking at this collection of china on the wall here, I think they're people with very clear-cut opinions, very straightforward. They like to know exactly what things are. They think purely in terms of black and white. That's why they like all these hard and shiny objects. And they have old-fashioned values as well. Look at this bug. They're certainly royalists. As you can see, there are plants and flowers in every conceivable corner of this house. Will the bedroom look like a jungle as well? Let's have a look. What a collection of horticultural pinups. I think these people are probably very heavy sleepers, and they've had the walls painted this color to shock them out of bed in the morning. <laughs> Let's look at some of the evidence now. The incomprehensible wall hanging. The serious television set. The Charles and Diana mugs. And the flower photos. Who lives in a house like this? Well, David, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lloyd, and... Uh... Any thoughts yet, anybody? And now for our home and studio audience, not for our panel, here's whose house it is. <laughs> Slightly different audience reaction there the last mm. time. Alan. The audience approves of these people enormously, despite the fact that one of them lives in a tent in the garden. Which <laughs> suggests the marriage is not all that it might be, because the tent was never explained. Uh, whoever it is also knits his own walls, which is strange. 
And I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on these things where, where anthropologists foregather, I don't know all the artifacts, but those things going up the, uh, the staircase looks like they were pinched from airports. It's airport <laughs> art. I think we're looking for an airport thief who lives in a tent, and I don't know where he pinched the Charles and Dye mug from, but obviously deeply loved. It must be a gardener of some kind. No, it's not. Why don't they applaud something? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a singing gardening burglar. <laughs> Very good, very good tour, however, of the house. That. Moira. I get a very masculine feeling from the house. I think this is a... <laughs> scoff, scoff. Um, Do you want to revise that? <laughs> try. I get a very feminine... Try that. No. Uh, a person who's travelled wild... <laughs> wildly as well as widely. Uh, very interested in... <laughs> in humour. Um, a humorous traveller. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. Willie. I wasn't paying a lot of attention after I saw the weeping fig. Now, I've killed more indoor plants by talking to them. They've died of boredom. <laughs> on, how on earth did you cheer up a weeping fig? Then I read the piano. You played the piano to it. So one learns a little something. Now, these people, if there is more than one, he was zaying again. They've roamed the globe, they've got Africa, the Orient. Then the fish on the plates. So I thought perhaps they'd done all this underwater. Hans and Lottie Hass leapt to mind. <laughs> then I thought, would Hans and Lottie have a Charles and Diana mug? They got a Hans and Lottie mug. <laughs> the flowers in the bedroom confused me, and I thought in the end it must be a blue Peter presenter who's been taken away by men in white jackets. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you haven't dealt with everything yet. You haven't dealt with serious TV viewer, clear-cut opinions from their China, and lots of things like that. Well, the audience laughed at the masculine and didn't respond to the feminine. I can only conclude it must belong to Hinge and Brackett. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Clear-cut views, old-fashioned values, serious TV viewer. Moira. I'm thoroughly bemused. I'm totally lost. No idea. Willie. Nancy Banks Smith. <laughs> well, you've got a TV viewer there, but in fact, it's the queen of television viewers, the, the absolute, described once as the headmistress of the silent majority, Mrs. Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, thank you. Nobody gets me. Nobody got Nobody you at all, you got see. Me. I tried to help them with a the yes, serious, I heard serious it. TV yes, viewing, clear you cut. Yes. You didn't get near this, Willie, did you? No, way, yeah, no. I was put off by the exploded string vest in the hall. I didn't, <laughs> oh. I didn't, I didn't know where to look. Yes. Yes. What was that? That I bought. Uh, from a, a Dutch lady who, you see, we live very close to the East Coast, and, and uh, Dutch artists come across float. with sort of, pardon? Float. Float, <laughs> yes, they float across with, you know, that sort of uh, production and so forth and so on, and they just take a room for one afternoon. I, I was absolutely thrilled with that, and it's been hanging there ever since. I dust it occasionally. You've also got a tennis court, haven't you? Yes. Which you won in a rather unusual <laughs> way, didn't you? Is that true? Well, a book was being published about a former director general of the BBC. And the Observer carried, you know how they run two full pages before the book was published? And I read the first page of great interest, and I, then I turned it over and I saw a little photograph of me in one of the columns. I thought, oh, good gracious, what's that about? And then there was about eight inches of what the said director general had said about me. I won't repeat it. But however, uh, I had, I thought, actually, it didn't worry me at the time. I, I have to let these things go over me. But then I realized next morning that that was the sort of official biography of this person. And that book was going to go all over the world in all the libraries, etc., etc. So I had a word with my solicitor next morning. He said, We take three libel actions. I said, well, you don't take that one, you don't take that one, but we will take that. That was against the observer. That, it was that one. <laughs> that one there. Right. And uh, so I won the libel action, and I thought, now, what shall I do with this? And what we did was buy a bit more land and build a tennis court. So that's how the tennis court came about. 
as a, as a, as a generous gift at the end of a live lecture. From the publishers, I suppose. From the newspaper. From the newspaper. Yes. Right. The That's publishers very, took, I, the pa took the pages out of the book. They very the unusual book. way to yeah. Are you going to ask me about the posters in the bedroom? <laughs> all right. Let Do me, ask wait, me about all right, the posters. Just a minute. Let me get ready for that. <coughs> <coughs> Mary, I thought I'd ask you about the posters <laughs> in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the horticultural pinner. Yes. Who did those? Yes. Well, the short answer is I did. You see, I'm a very keen gardener. Very keen gardener. And I, and I love flowers and creating colours and shapes and all this with my flowers. Uh, one day, I used to teach art, you know, and one day I thought, gosh, I'd love to paint that group of flowers. So I got some paints out and it was useless, useless. And my son came out and he said, hmm, not much good, is it? I said, no. He said, why don't you buy a camera? I said, good idea. So off I went and I bought a camera and I took all those posters as, you know, snaps. And then I had them blown up into posters. So all through the winter, when there's no flowers in the garden or anything, I can sit in bed and gaze on my posters. I've just done three more. Fantastic. You, you can sell them as a collection, I think. They What's look the tremendous. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> tremendous. Other. Well, Any why, other questions? Why don't you deadhead the lupins? I thought you had to deadhead lupins. Well, you do. I never oh. leave any dead lupins because I want a second crop. There those are no were, dead lupins those in that were garden. Go, I'm just a, coming into bud. Mary says there are no dead lupins in her house. No. And uh, or even in garden. her garden. But we'd Am like I going to have we'd this? like to present you with a gold key, Mary. Oh. It's been a delight having you with us. Isn't that and that is the gold through the keyhole key. Our okay. thanks to Mary, our thanks to our glorious panel over here, to Alan Corrin, Maura Stewart, and Willie Rushton, to Mary, of course, and to and to our magnificent five star, as well, our marvellous homeowners, and of course to Lloyd Grossman, the only man in the country who still makes house calls. Until the next time, good night. Another classic show for you next here on Challenge. And would you risk the gamble? You could end up with just your BFH. Bullseye, next on Challenge. Then, fastest finger first, get you into the hot seat. Classic Millionaire is weeknights at 10.